This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and Blacktail Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. Hey, this is Jody Stemmler. We are here in Denver, Colorado on the Talking Mule Deer, Mule Deer Foundation podcast. We've got Steve Belinda here. Welcome. And we've also got Seth Gallagher with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Welcome, Seth. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Great. Hey, Seth. You ordered up some great weather for us today in Denver. It's not snowing yet. Not yet. (laughs) Life is good when it's not snowing in Denver. (laughs) So thank you so much for letting us come in here to talk to you today. We've got a lot to cover. Um, The first is National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, People may have heard of it, may not have. Tell us a little bit about the organization and what you all do. Sure, sure. So the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, you'll hear us referred to as NIFWIF often. Um, is Gotta a, love those acronyms. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ours is particularly distinctive, I think. So, <laughs> it's better um, than NFWF, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're a congressionally chartered uh, nonprofit. So we were uh, chartered by Congress in 1984. Um, we're the nation's largest conservation grant maker. Uh, we receive our money through uh, multiple avenues, but we get a federal appropriation of money, and we work with our federal partners at a state and regional level and, and get federal funding through various cooperative agreements. So so the federal appropriation means that Congress will appropriate, will actually give money through the federal That's the, the correct. agencies, right? That's okay. correct. And then, our, and then our mission is to take that to take that funding and leverage it with private dollars. Right. And so okay. we, we work with uh, corporations, other foundations. Um, to so take you get your money, money through an interior or agriculture appropriations bill, or is it just interior? Uh, well, we, we get uh, appropriations from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM, the Forest Service, and NOAA. Or the, okay, or so the that's all in National, yeah. Yeah. National yeah. Oceanic and yep. Atmospheric, and that would be for, I would assume, anadromous fish. Yeah, salmon, and a, a, lot of, like a lot of our coastal work. Okay, you know, coastal out of the work. Denver yep. office, we don't deal sense. a lot with our <laughs> coral reef and ter- sea turtle okay. program, but, but we do have that. You know, it's a, right. the organization's nationwide in scope. Well, the reason I ask that is, that, you know, a lot of the, the funding that goes out to the field through the Natural Resource Conservation Service, that's agriculture. Sure. And so I just wanted to make sure that we recognize the distinction from that there are multiple uh, cabinet agencies get money out there through grant making process. Absolutely, we get we get Forest Service Forest appropriations, service. Yep. which is ag, ag, which is ag, ag. ag. and then okay. and then we do have a, a tremendous number of cooperative agreements with USDA through the Natural Resources Conservation right. Service through NRCS. Um, and so we, um, you know, it, it, particularly out west here, you know, we're working with those states quite a bit. So. And and not to get uh, too wonky, but obviously uh, Forest Service is funded through the Interior Appropriation. So it's all funded under the same bill where you would get your funding. Right? Right. Okay, gotcha. All right, enough of the wonk stuff. Yeah. How do you work on the, the private side as well? And tell us some of the organizations or industry p- folks that you do sure, work with. Sure, sure. I mean, so, so you know, depending on the program, we work with a, we work with a, a various degree of, of um, private entities. Some of it's uh, philanthropic through corporate responsibility, things like that. Uh, we work with other foundations who have uh, similar overla- overlapping resource concerns and issues, um, and so we 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 get funding passed through um, us via them. Northern Great Plains is a great example. We have a private foundation um, who who helps to sponsor that uh, program, um, and then also uh, we we oftentimes receive settlement money. So when when bad things happen. Oftentimes, there's like the oil spill down. Yeah, exactly. The deep yep, horizon, yep. right? The yeah. deep horizon yep. um, is a is a great example. We have you know a whole, a whole uh, coastal Gulf Coast program that uh, is working on on distributing uh, those funds for conservation efforts throughout the Gulf. So, so since 1984, how much money has NIFWIF given for conservation? <laughs> A lot. Is it in the billions? It yet? is. Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to look. I don't have that number off the top of my head. But but I, yeah, but I think the, billions is a is a is impressive enough yes, for sure. Yeah, so. for sure. But I think it's interesting that it's been so much, but yet if you would ask folks on the street, what is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation? Unless you're getting a grant, you're probably not going to know about it. Yeah, we're 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 pretty low key in that way, um, but uh, behind the scenes, you know, there's a lot of uh, efforts that we're helping to fund and and. Uh, yeah, nationwide, lots of different priorities throughout the nation. Trying to really focus on landscape level conservation as well and boots on the ground. So we don't fund advocacy. We don't fund litigation. Um, we, we fund, uh, you know, direct um, work towards uh, species conservation and habitat conservation on the ground. 
And this is going to be relevant here. We're going to talk about this in a little bit um, because of Western big game migratory corridors. So we'll, we'll right. get in that. So, so there, there's a, a, an absolute tie-in and a lot of other projects that you've been funded in. But let's still want to give a little bit more background on on the organization and, and you. What, sure. What's your background? How did you come to NIF with? Yeah, sure. So um, I uh, came out west in, in the early 2000s. I worked for uh, an organization called uh, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. It's now known as Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. I was there for 11 years. Uh, worked in their private lands program. Are you a biologist? Um, I am. Yeah, I have uh, went to college kind of all over the place: uh, North Dakota, Tennessee, and and Michigan. Okay. Um, and and then after <laughs> pretty eclectic mix yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, and then after uh, grad school, uh, ended up here in, in Colorado uh, again with Bird Observatory, and and uh, I worked exclusively in their private lands program. So so we managed um, folks that sat in NRCS offices that helped administer farm bill grants and programs with private landowners. So they would provide technical and financial assistance to, to ranching and farming communities, mostly Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming. Um, Were you working on mountain plover? Yep, I worked a ton on mountain plover, lesser prairie chicken. Nice. Um, yep. In some pretty good uh, eastern range mule deer habitat yep. out there, a lot of absolutely. that. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. And, and uh, of course, pronghorn. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we while it was, while it was, bird was in our name, um, you know, the boots that were, boots on the ground really, focused on a broader spectrum um, and, and used things like state wildlife action plans to guide, you know, what were the important uh, priorities. Yeah. And, so, and this is all <laughs> voluntary, collaborative type conservation work that you're doing with those private landowners, right? I That's mean, correct. I, I mean, those, those programs have been fantastic to work with ranchers and farmers to figure out, you know, when they have species, how can they you know, improve what they're doing or continue to do what they're doing and make it continue to be profitable and be also good for the Absol habitat and the wildlife. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Everything was voluntary and, um, you know, really looking for the win-wins, um, which I think are, are, um, more apparent when you're out there working in these communities, uh, you know, folks live out there for a reason and really appreciate the wildlife that they have. And, and by and large, those agricultural communities are, are very much willing to work with conservation entities, um, you know, to, to conserve species. And so it was a very positive experience. Um, you know, great, great couple of years, uh, or dec better part of a decade doing that. Um, and then went to the sage grouse initiative for a couple of years, mm -hmm. managed their, uh, boots on the ground throughout the West. So Those, uh, covered 11 Western States. Um, and then in, in 2015, uh, 2016 came over to NIFWF here and, and, um, you know, it was interesting when I was a biologist, uh, at non nonprofit organizations, I actually wrote a lot of grants to NIFWF, and so it was proposals. Really, yeah, proposals. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how many really of those familiar. got funded? <laughs> uh, I think I wrote eleven and got eight. So that's it was, not bad. That's, that's a pretty, pretty good rate. Good. So, um, so I was really familiar uh, um, being a grantee on the flip side, and so um, NIFWF um, about 2015 kind of did a, a strategic uh, planning session where they looked at where were they, you know, where, where were the offices and, and, um, you know, we we're based in DC. We have an office in Minnesota. We have an office in, in San Francisco and Portland, but that leaves a lot of country in between that, that really wasn't, um, covered from a field level perspective. And so, um, they opened a Denver office in 2015. And, and so, uh, when that happened, uh, applied for a program manager position here I am. So really have enjoyed my time and, um, it's, it's been a, a great experience assisting, uh, you know, in the effort to bring, resources to the region um, for all the partners and doing stuff on the ground. The person who runs the office is Chris West, yep. right? Yep. And if I'm not mistaken, he was Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust, That's right? That's correct, yeah. So, so he, he also had been very involved in working with ranchers and, and doing conservation easements and things like that as yep. well, right? Yep. So Chris and I had actually worked together, um, you know, in, in private lands conservation for, for uh, again, the better part of a decade prior to NIFWF opening the Denver office. And yeah, so Chris was hired on as the regional director. Um, and has has a uh, tremendous amount of experience and background in the land conservation arena, um, conservation easements and, and those sorts of things. And so, yeah, Chris is Chris is the regional director, and then Kirsten Neff is here, and she manages a lot of our um, programs to the south, Southwest Rivers and, and Pecos Rivers conservation program. Um, so we we basically cover the mountain time zone here out of Denver, and uh, the two programs I manage are uh, Sagebrush Landscapes and then Northern Great Plains. Um, yeah. Great. So you mentioned something there that uh, your work has been private, mostly in private land conservation. My experience has been in mostly public land conservation. Um, what's the biggest challenge to conservation of private lands that that you're aware of that we don't face on public lands? That's a good question. Uh, 
I, you know, I mean, I would say um, a, a lot of the decisions that are made on how private lands are managed are a result of, of oftentimes market-driven forces. And so the Northern Great Plains is a great example of, you know, fluctuating commodity prices really at times can dictate what sort of land use there is. In other words, is it livestock grazing versus tillage agriculture? And, and from a grasslands perspective, is, is, it, uh, is it more valuable from a landowner, um, you know, bottom line, to have something in a crop rotation than it is, say, in, in livestock grazing. And so we see those sort of forces um, really having an impact on, on land use um, in that private uh, agricultural matrix versus, you know, I think where uh, we have public lands, while there's certainly multiple uses um, that go along with those, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot more regulated in the sense of what can be done and what can't be done in certain areas. And so I think that, at least from a grasslands perspective, um, that's really kind of the dynamic right now that's probably the biggest conservation challenge. Well, and I think the important thing about private land conservation is to recognize that that landowner has to make a living. Sure. They're living there and raising a family and wanting to have next generation come on. So they do need to make a living off of their, their land. So having no use is not an option for sure. them. But on the the other side of that is without them there on the landscape, you know, and, and we see it all the time here, that'll get sold or separated out and become development or, or moved into different uses. So so trying to find a happy medium that, that helps those landowners be profitable, sure. but also um, is keeping that operation going and is good doing good pra- practices for wildlife. It's, it's, a, it's an important balance to try to find. And I think that's a, a huge shift in conservation, um, you know, w- the work that's being done on the ground uh, in, in the recent decades, I think. And, and not to mention that we're reliant on the resources that are produced. I mean, it's not to say that tillage agriculture is is a bad thing. It's something that we're all reliant on to some degree. It's just from a grasslands conservation perspective, and if if these open spaces and these species that inhabit these areas are important to us, you know, how do we how do we balance that with the need to have you know agriculture and feed the world? Um, and so uh, you know, it's 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 a pretty complex issue when you start to carve it up, whether it's, you know, an individual's bottom line or what society needs and then, and then what we have left and how do we, how do we best conserve it and balance it. And in sagebrush ecosystems, which obviously is particularly relevant for, for mule deer, um, you know, and the Sagegrass Initiative is a great example of trying to find a way to continue to, to have profitable ranching, livestock grazing on private lands, on public lands as well, um, but also continue to maintain a healthy sagebrush ecosystem. The grasses, the forbs that, that are good for sage grouse and mule deer and the, you know, 300 plus other species that, that use sage grouse, a sagebrush habitat. So, um, so it's, it's that, that nexus of federal and, and private lands is a huge consideration and something that, we want to loop in now the migration corridors aspect is um, trying to interweave that in, in management for species that, you know, move across yeah. many different types of land ownership um, throughout the course of their seasonal cycle. Um, you know, this is this is a challenge. And, and, and NIFWIF, so obviously we've talked about a number of times the, uh, the Secretarial Order 3362, which was signed by Secretary of the Interior Zinke last year at Hunt Expo this year in February, um, you guys just released um, a, a new request for p- proposals for a big grant, $2.5 million, yeah. $2.7 million. $2.7 yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. What's, sure. What's that involved? Yeah, so so the um, you know the RFP that we just released is in support of the secretarial order, um, and it's really the funding um, that's being channeled through NIFWIF is, again, to fund on the ground conservation actions. And so, you know, if you really dissect the the secretarial order, it kind of gets into some pretty tactical um, conservation issues as far as addressing bottlenecks or addressing habitat issues. Um, and so this, this is uh, funding to, to uh, help address that. And so uh, it's really geared towards um, assisting the States um, in what they're, what they've identified as priorities. And so if you look at the RFP, it links to, um, 11 different state plans and those state plans are really essentially a roadmap for us and for our grantees of you know where are the geographies and what are the actions that the states are really prioritizing to put on the ground and and, and those state plans were <coughs> developed in specific response to the secretary order correct that's correct yeah. yeah and so they're all available out there now so we can go 
send folks out there to look to see where their state fish and game agency said these are the projects or areas we think are important in relation to this specific secretarial order. Yep. And if I remember, uh, there was a press release that came out that kind of identified top line before the plans were released. And, and, and some of the priorities, the ones that resonated the most across multiple states were transportation um, highways. Um, there was some issues with invasive species. Cheatgrass was an mm -hmm. issue. Um, there was a so, uh, couple the, with uh, energy, oil and gas, as well as renewable. I think there was one state that, that recognized energy, but I think the other one was the we don't know factor. Yep. Is there's a huge gap in information on animals we know are moving or we know there's important winter ranges, but we don't have that specific enough information to do something on the ground yet and so that there yeah is and it's it's important to make the point too that um you know there the funding that's associated with the secretarial order there's sort of two two uh pieces to this and, and nifwif is really managing the on the ground conservation piece and there's but there is also funding uh for research needs so those are identified in the state plan as well and i think that helps the state right. agencies get to that we don't know where, and, and um, that funding's happening between Interior and the states. So, yeah, that's, so a, that's a long way of saying that the NIFWIF RFP isn't funding research, right. but there is research funding available. Right, yeah, because there, the, the, the research needs, some of the states have very robust, I mean, Wyoming yeah. is the, the perfect example of that. They've got great mapping of, of theirs, and some are following suit, and there's been efforts to get better data, but other states haven't. And I do, and again, another set of releases that came out where it was – like $300,000 or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember the numbers in Arizona to study a transportation corridor for right. the new interstate they're putting in between, is it Phoenix and Vegas mm. or whatever? So <laughs> one of those. Um, and Utah as well, right? And that was urban deer, um, right. you know, suburban development impacting corridors. And that was 260000 or something like that. And those came directly from agencies. Sure. Yeah. So, so that's basically buying collars, having the yep. money to put satellite collars on on deer or other big game and then understand where they're going and running the new models yeah um so transportation was identified and having worked on overpasses and underpasses uh as part of my career i can tell you 2.7 million isn't going to get no, you much there. not going to go very so far i can imagine that the the bulk of where you're going to be looking is that other on the ground or boots on the ground factor can you explain a little bit what you mean by on the ground work? Sure. So, I mean, I think in relation, and we're already getting inquiries about the highway work, you know, as you mentioned, you know, those overpass underpass projects are, are really expensive and, and 2.7 million alone might not, you know, might, might get you might, one, might, yeah, <laughs> might get you one or part of one or something like that. But, um, you know, in, in regard to that, when we talk about conservation actions, it, it, this funding could be eligible to uh, fund a component of a project like that. So it might be fencing, right. you know, to help funnel the animals. It may be uh, a conservation easement to help protect the ground that's adjacent to the bottleneck. You know, if, if ex-urban development or some other uh, disturbance is a potential threat. Um, so, so there's ways I think this funding could work in tandem with the highway work. But looking at the state plans, um, you know, there's really... Um, a, a very a large variation in in what the threats are or the perceived threats yes. are, and and the tools that are out there to to uh, address those are pretty diverse. And so it could be everything. You know, Jody, you mentioned cheatgrass, so mm -hmm. it could be it could be projects that are addressing invasives. It could be uh, projects that are addressing encroaching conifer. Mm -hmm. um, so habitat restoration. Yeah, habitat areas restoration. For... Uh, that we uh, a lot of the state plans address or talk about. Um, aspen regeneration mm -hmm. so um, it could be you know anything from habitat restoration and improvement through through things like you know actual hard restoration whether that's machinery and seeding and those sorts of things to to um, you know addressing barriers or retrofitting fences yeah. um, so there's but really you, a whole you menu. see a lot of pictures of fences put in the wrong spot or the wrong type of fences right in migratory pathways and i think that's an easy fix totally um, I, I know and I that goes back to the private land working with private yeah, landowners yeah. as well as having that relationship and saying, you know, this particular area is an important corridor and, yeah. and um, you know, what can we do to either drop fences or, um, you know, smooth if, wire. Sure. If I never have to free another animal out of a fence in my life, I'll be happy if this grant helps do that. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it's a, it's tough to see an animal that's strung up on a fence and it died of starvation or the predators got it. Or just winter took its toll, and, and 
you know, those are those are the things that we can probably identify and fix with an effort like this. And, and I think that's one of you know, I think it's a it's it's low hanging you know, what we consider low hanging fruit as a project, you know. I mean it's there's a lot of fence out there that isn't wildlife friendly that we can convert um, or remove and, and better configure for these migratory corridors. And I think what people don't see is, you know, they see the pictures, you know, and, and that really leaves an impression. But what they don't see is the changed behavior and what that could potentially even mean for resource utilization for these critters, you know. Um, they may It may be, you know, I'm thinking of pronghorn, pronghorn in particular. Yeah, they you know, don't. It's, they get to a highway with a really bad fence, and they may done. be stuck in a spot where there's not a lot of resources for them to get through the winter. And pronghorn won't use a underpass either, right? To, right? So I mean, well, usually yeah. they're not. They, not, they don't like to jump they, fences except for the buck I was hunting last week in <laughs> eastern Montana. I've seen him do it. I've Walked seen him do right it. down the public land line, yeah. and as he was getting he close, saw he you decided coming. to jump the fence on the private It's funny land, how some so. of them don't read the yeah. textbook, right? <laughs> right. Um, well, that and uh, some of these other things I'm looking through this um, is conservation easements um, and management agreements, too. So that that deals with the, the development issue, potentially, because mm-hmm. that is one of the other big issues identified by a number of the states is suburban development into, in particular, winter range. Right. I mean, though, they can also block bottleneck areas. There's, you know, um, some of the research out of Wyoming has shown very wide areas and then other areas are very, very narrow. And if something were to happen to that narrow area it could really yeah, short circuit the entire route. The other stuff they're shown is the importance of these stopover sites too. You know, the, the migration occurs and they walk through a particular spot on one day in a given year. And it's important that it's available to them, but they'll get to these stopover spots and they'll spend 95% of their time in one place, one general area. And you know, if that, if that area isn't protected from fragmentation or isn't right. um, the highest quality habitat, then, then those are the kinds of issues that we can, work on and address as well sort of taking what we've learned in the waterfowl world and looking at it now for other species yep. right so one of the other things here and this is particularly relevant for a number of our mule deer states this year is fire restoration mm-hmm. after a fire um so some of these funds could be used yeah. for for rehabilitating a site that that was was burned and mm-hmm. put in um seed reseed or and you've been working on some of these projects yeah, yeah. In, in idaho right yeah we've just uh this year finished uh project uh, we've got one more year of funding uh, we've done about 400,000 sagebrush and bitterbush plants in an area that was burned in 2008 uh, in important in an area that had 10,000 mule deer in it yeah. and you know it also overlaps with uh, greater sage grouse habitat so we're looking at that you know uh, maximizing our effort but we still have a cheatgrass problem uh, we still have a, a fire return interval problem that you know even if you get plants established there's so much annual fuel out there that are we going to lose it? Plus, we're still burning. I think we burned another million and a half acres in Idaho alone this year, and Nevada got Nevada really hit. Nevada so, so yeah. there's, as I Utah like to had say, some pretty hot th- fires. There's too, a really. generation or two worth of just restoration of fire work sure. out there, and you know the great thing about that is, is we're learning how to combat the invasives, and we also know how to plant, you know, plant seed and get reestablished. So. Hopefully those two things are going to come together and we're really going to be able to jumpstart the restoration of these uh, impacted areas. Plus, you know, let's face it, we killed a lot of sagebrush, out, you know, in the 40s and 50s oh, yeah. mm. just because we could. And there's a lot of places we can go back to in the more shrubby country and get, you know, those areas that haven't been affected by fire, but get those back to better habitats for big game. And, you know, that is, as we know, a lot of these are in important migratory areas or winter ranges. Um, You know, you mentioned sage grouse too, and I think it's important to note that um, a lot of the practices that we're looking at implementation of, the benefit is going to go far beyond just big game, right? Absolutely. Um, Whether you're a brewer sparrow or a pygmy rabbit or a sage grouse, that whole suite of of sage obligate species is really going to, will benefit from the stuff that we're, we're looking to work with partners on. So um, that's just an important point that I think, you know, sometimes we, we get clogged up in our labels at times, yeah. but um, well, we appreciate you that saying that both at the mule deer foundation and the North American grouse partnership, because we have advocated for years that you're working on a suite of species using maybe the mule deer or the sage grouse as a flagship to get folks interested or to get money to it. But really this is about ecosystem restoration, right? What's good for one's going to be good for most of the others out there. Yeah. Cool. And so now funding for this program, yeah. where did it come from? Sure. 
Uh, so there's 2.7 million available now. Uh, Two million uh, came from the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. Uh, 450,000 came from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, um, and then uh, 250,000 from ConocoPhillips. Okay. So that's cool. the that's the breakdown, and um, you is know, that their spirit of conservation? It's program? Uh, it, it it's a I, be, I believe the funding was sort of yeah taken out of that yeah. pot and and moved into this RFP, yeah. if you will. So um, so so just for our listeners, ConocoPhillips has a as a initiative amongst its company called the Spirit of Conservation, where they do conservation granting and other environmental works through that. Yep, Conoco is a big a big partner uh, of NIFWF and. Um, and it's great to see some some non-federal resources yeah. put and into And they've this. been they've been very active yeah. on conservation projects in sagegrass, a sagebrush yeah. inter, you know, and Intermountain West Joint Venture. I know yep. they're very involved in in sagebrush conservation for that. So it's a logical connection for them, yep. obviously. So tell us how um, what things people where they could find information about this grant um, and within that that the, the your uh, RFP also includes the link to the state plans that are out there as well. So let us know what people can look into uh, if they're interested in pursuing. Sure. If you look at, uh, if you go to our homepage, nifwif.org. N-F-W-F.org. <laughs> um, in the right-hand side, there's a, uh, on the homepage, there's a press release column, and you can kind of sift through that, and there's a press release in there about the secretarial order. Um, if you click on that press release, there's a link. Um, I think I think it's uh, nifwif.org, Western, big game. I have to edit this. Yep. <laughs> it's nifwif.org slash western migrations. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and that'll get you there. And that, that'll actually link you to the RFP. There'll be a link to the RFP there, and there'll be a link to all the state plans as well. Um, and that, right. that should get you all the information you need. If you have questions about specific projects, my contact information is on that page as well. And, and we're happy to visit with folks if they have ideas about whether they think you know, a project is a good fit or not. Yeah, and I do know that each state and each federal agency has liaisons too. So if yep. you're in an office, maybe ask a biologist or ask a manager and say, hey, who can I talk to? I'm interested in working with you on this. Yeah, the biggest thing I think is to look at those state plans and see, you know, if the project that you're thinking about fits within those geographies. That's sort of the first cut as as whether or not, you know, right. what you've got cooking is, is, is an appropriate well, and, and just to be clear, eligible entities for this are NGOs, nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. um, state and federal agencies, local governments, yep. municipal governments, and Indian tribes. So it, it's important, you know, to, to pull together resources. Yep. And the other part that's important um, and why it's relevant to know those state plans is your proposal needs to be accompanied by a letter of support from the director's office of the State Fish and Wildlife Agency, that's right? So, yep. so and that's, that's ma mainly to try to make sure everything is integrated, that, yep. that there are no grants that are going to go off on something that that doesn't fit within the original priorities of, of what the states have identified absolutely and a communication issue we just want to make sure that all our state partners are well aware of what the efforts are and and what we're looking at and and we'll have a review committee made up of um, various agencies and organizations both funding and, and partners throughout the region that'll look at that uh, and what's the deadline those are due january 10th january 10th yep and uh, straight to full proposal sometimes We'll do pre-proposals. This one is, uh, is straight to full proposals, so you'll have to log into our Easy Grants, which is our, our web portal, um, and then that'll walk you through the application process. Cool. And you are, uh, the other thing, I think you were still requiring the one-to-one -one match for non-federal match. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. So so yep. what that means is, is for every dollar you're applying for, you have to show that there is a matching dollar that's non-federal source to go along with that. So you're really leveraging this money so to 5.4 million. Yeah. And, and, and that, um, match can be cash or in kind. And that's important to know too, is, you know, in kind could be anything from like volunteer hours. Mm -hmm. If you have volunteers working on a project, or if you have another partner who's paying for a portion of the bill, um, on some other aspect of the project, you can, you can show that all as match. And if folks have questions about, what is match and what isn't match? We're, we're Call me. <laughs> <laughs> Seth knows how artful I can be on that. So, 
Excellent. Well, this sounds, it's great. Thank you for taking the, the lead on this and working with the agencies, Absolutely. both state and federal, to make something like this happen, because it's really neat to see something that was signed at Hunt Expo to big uh, to do last year, something yeah. at the Mule Deer Foundation convention last year. And this is where it's going. This yep. is, the, it has moved on. It is, it is developing and blooming into its own big initiative that, uh, that those of us who care about Western rangeland conservation, mule deer, pronghorn, elk um, can see results. We're, yeah. we're starting to see things moving forward. It's extremely satisfying to see an order from a cabinet secretary become actionable to people outside the agency. Yeah. Yeah, it's rare for it to happen this quick, too. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're really trying to show some results and get some really early wins on this and we're excited to see what we're going to get. This is this is great conservation. I mean, this has a t tremendous amount of potential, as you said, not just for these migratory big game animals, but for so many other species. It has it has potential for very far-reaching impacts. Sure. So, what's the next step on this? When you get the RFPs in after the date, you review it with a team. You get opinions from other folks, and then you take that back through your decision making. Is this a a something you believe is going to be a long-term effort, or is this going to be a uh, shot out of the canyon, couple year thing, and then. Uh, well, we we on. certainly hope to integrate it. You know, we, ha um, the Rocky Mountain office being new, fairly new regionally, we're sort of looking at all the programs that we currently have available and how we're, how we're going to package those in the future and streamline them. But we certainly hope to, that that ungulate migration, big game migration, remains um, a portion of what we do. Whether you know how, whether it's called that as a its own RFP or, or whatever we're, you know, we're really kind of working on that. We do, we do anticipate this cycle of funding and then a 2019 cycle of funding. So, um, at a bare minimum, I think we'll, we'll see that. Um, and, uh, we'll just see how, how structurally it fits in right. the NIFWF programs in the future. But no, it's something that we, um, it certainly doesn't seem like the issue is going to get fixed overnight. So we, <laughs> for sure. we, we hope it's there for a while. When, when do you anticipate um, grants being awarded? Yeah, good question. So uh, we'll accept these in January. We'll review them basically in the month of January. And then the process from there is it goes to our board of directors for approval. If it has federal funding on it, it'll go, um, it'll be congressionally notified. So it'll go to, to the respective states that the work will be done in. If it passes all of those, that takes, that process takes about a month. Um, we're looking to hopefully make announcements on these grants in uh, March, April. Yeah. And so again, pretty quick. So pretty that accelerated is that is pretty remarkable. Us. It's accelerated um, for you guys, and it's also almost a, a year from the time the secretarial yeah. order is to get this kind of money on the ground for yeah. these projects. The the money that's directly coming from the agencies, your granting process for the habitat. That's and and we wanted to do that's that's very intentional. I mean, we want to have we want to be in a place where we can sign agreements with grantees in April or May. So that, they, so that they can get work done this year, Absolutely. you know, I mean, um, a lot of time when the, when the snow flies out here, the work stops. And so if we can, if we can get a jump on it this year, um, we'll feel pretty good going into that's a good point. Well, March is a good time. Cause you know, you have the North American wildlife conference in Denver in March this year. So yeah. that's true. You'll have a great opportunity to notify those States. Except that's in, in the beginning person. of March. So yeah. it may yeah. not, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. So this'll, this, this'll be a great thing to see moving forward because those projects will actually, the, the concept would be, I would imagine that they're going to be on the ground next summer starting to at least at the yeah preliminary hopefully parts you know it. i mean it, it depends, depends on the on the actual you know the individual project doing, right. but we do anticipate that some of this some work of this will money, get, yep. yeah we'll get that's right. pretty cool very cool so the mule deer foundation we've been prioritizing this issue now for oh, quite some time but uh really with the secretarial order um being the catalyst we've been looking at ways to increase the capacity and i know that we've submitted a grant to y'all to work on this issue through uh, your sagebrush initiatives program. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can tell us about that? <laughs> That's <laughs> leading. <laughs> I think I can. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, the last uh, round of sagebrush, um, our sagebrush landscapes program that came out uh, in the spring, we actually built in um, some big game migration uh, verbiage into the priority of that program as well. MDF applied um, for some capacity there, and, and uh, our board has approved a grant for 200000 to go to MDF to help um, with a coordinator position uh, to help get this t this exact kind of work done and put on the ground. So we're excited about that partnership um, to see where that all goes. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, 
That's cool. That's, That's awesome, exciting. Man. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to be able to work closer with the states, closer with folks on the ground and, you know, all for the benefit of actual, as you've called, boots on the ground, landscape level approach to conservation. Hopefully that's better things for mule deer, better things for sage grouse, better things for all the species that use those habitats that will be affected from the implementation of that money. So, yeah, thank you. And that that's exciting news for Mule Deer Foundation for sure. So, yeah. So Seth, it's been a privilege to talk to you today. It's uh, exciting you know, to hear everything that's going on. The money you guys are putting out there, the, the approach you're taking both personally and the, and the way that you're building this this uh, new grant and, and prioritizing migratory corridors and big game habitats is extremely uh, welcoming. And, you know, from the Mule Deer Foundation and all the other groups that, that we work with, we thank you for that. And we look forward to lots, lots more efforts, money, and success happening in these habitats. So again, it's thank a, you. It's going to be so exciting to see these things starting cool. to hit the ground and moving forward. It's, yeah. it's really neat. Well, well, thank you guys for having us. And, and thanks to MDF. We're looking forward to working um, with you guys in the future on this. And, you know, we can't do this without good, solid grantees. I right. mean, we can bring resources together, but without, again, without those boots on the ground, you know, our, our work um, doesn't go very far. So we appreciate y'all and what you do. All right, right, so if we want to learn more about the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we can go to your website, yep. and that is? www.nfwf.org. And you're here in Denver. They can, If folks are interested in any of your grants, they can find your information there. Yep. And you're more than willing to work with anyone trying to do conservation on the ground. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, for people who are not just interested in the Intermountain West, um, there's plenty of other projects going on around the country. Yeah. So there, there's oh, yeah. you, you'll be amazed at the work that NIFWF is involved yep. in. Go to um, our conservation programs tab, and you'll see a huge drop down of, of all the stuff we're doing. And it's... Uh, it's, it's impressive. It, it's it, it quite really a portfolio is. of it projects really and conservation. So you may not have ever heard of NIFWIF, <laughs> but you probably have seen results of some of the work that the organization has done without even realizing yeah. it. So, so Seth, great job. Keep it Thank up. You. And uh, we appreciate your time today. So from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado, I'm Jody Stemler. And I'm Steve Belinda. Until we talk to you next time, thank you. Thanks for talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.